why would you build a forest garden? To eat. To eat, exactly. <laughs> but why, there's a lot of reasons that people get involved in the idea of forest gardens. Does anybody actually know what a forest garden is? No. Oh, forest gardening is basically, well, the forests, why forests? Forests are the most productive um, organism on the planet. But they're not particularly useful for us as humans. Uh, they don't provide typically all our needs in a temperate sense. Uh, but, it's a, but the idea of the forest gardening is basically that we can design an ecosystem, we can design a habitat for us and other animals that we can get full benefits of. Uh, eucalyptus forests, forest, I love eucalyptus forests in, in, around the place. It's not much good for us, really. We're not gonna get, you're not gonna feed a, a population of six, how many, how many, how many we got here in Australia now? Uh, 20, no, it's 23 or 23, 23 million people yeah. on, a, on, a, on a forest system like the eucalypts. Very useful, but not, so it's about designing a complete ecosystem. And what I mean by that, we talk about very quickly about um, the layers of a forest, typically when we do this. So, a forest typically you have your advanced trees, right? And we talk about seven layers. And this is different in terms of you're looking at a, a, a multi-dimensional production system in contrast to a vegetable garden system. Right? There's your raised bed and you can grow a few things in there. And you can be very productive in a vegetable garden system, but you've got to keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. Whereas the idea behind a forest garden system is you can use the same sort of space. I'm not going to use that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use this one. Too much work. Get another board. <laughs> so we designed it according to the layers of the forest. All right. Now in the tropic, in the tropics, you can probably put a few extra layers in. This is I'm talking about temperate forests. So. We're designing it like an open woodland, effectively. So a lot of people say, but the oh, forests are all enclosed and there's no light and you can't get... No, well, we design it. We're in charge. So we design it so there's enough light penetrating down to the bottom layers when we design these sort of systems. But we design it nonetheless on the same basic ecosystem. So we have advanced trees like this sort of thing. And they might be, depending on where you are, if you've got some acreage, they might be up to 10 metres high. If you've got an urban block, well, the upper canopy is going to be probably three to four metres high. Right? So it's it's a movable feat. You can design it to, according to your own specifications. But the idea is the basic way. So these top trees, typically, you're not going to be able to harvest much of a tree about 10 metres or so. <laughs> you're not going to have to get up there and harvest whatever. So those sorts of trees we typically use are like nuts or legumes, nitrogen fixing trees, those sorts of trees. And then underneath that we might put some fruit trees. So we'll put some apples or whatever. Right, so this is, so again, you're making sure that they get ample light because an apple tree needs, well, what does an apple tree need to grow? It needs air, it needs all those sorts of things. Right, so that's the second layer. The third layer would be small shrubs. Right. Some of these which we'll talk about as I go through today. All productive though. Next layer would be a ground cover layer. Because right. there's lots of things on the ground that you can actually put in the ground that are going to be very useful. The fifth layer would be something like um, typically herbaceous plants. Right. Things that grow up and, and die down again. So that's another layer within the forest system. And then we talk about six, which is a root layer. So you can have other things that grow tubers and roots and things like that. So you, so you can see you're utilising a lot of the space and getting good production out of the horror. And typically the seven layers we have are things like climbers. So kiwi vines and those sorts of things, passion fruits and small dwarf passion fruits and things like that. So this is sort of seven layers of a forest system. So depending on where you are, it may depend that you may get three or four of those. That's the only room you've got. If you've just got an urban backyard, you might only get you know, 
I'd say five layers of persistence, right, depending on where you are. Right. Does everybody got an idea? So that's basically when we talk about a forest garden or fruit forest, that's the basic concept. But why would you do it? Why would you want to do one of those? Work smarter, not harder. Work smarter, not harder, exactly. Mimic nature. Yeah, but the essence. Because I can tell you how. You've got to provide the why. I can't provide the why. It's an individual thing. I'm a plant nut, so my why is probably doing a bit different to yours. I mean, it might be a case of food security. Who's had that as an issue? We don't talk about that a lot as a society, but food security is really important. We had some examples of that um, not so long ago when um, the Chinese, for example, loved their baby formula and their own people couldn't get it because the Chinese are actually taking it and taking it overseas. I mean, this is something that other third world countries have been dealing with for a very long time. We, we suddenly get very passionate about chia seed <laughs> and the the third world people, um, guys grow it and they don't have any good things themselves because we're eating it all, all of a sudden because it's a fashionable plant. So it's, yeah, so we're all part of that. So food security could be a major issue for doing things like this. The big one, the elephant in the room, climate change, of course. Really good thing to be doing with climate change. Um, particularly with agricultural systems. I know you guys are, are particularly passionate about agriculture and all those sorts of things, so I won't get too much into that. But out there in the other world, where they use agricultural chemicals, um, like nitrous oxide, like when they use nitrogen and things like that, particularly nitrogen that can be like a nitrogen fertiliser, chemical fertiliser. A lot of that is released during the agricultural process and goes in, becomes gases off and goes to form a really potent greenhouse gas. Uh, so it's important that we get, when we have nitrogen, we store it in the ground, we store it where it belongs. And that's when I talk about nitrogen fixing trees. Nitrogen fixing trees in a forest system, really, really helpful because it's keeping the nitrogen intact and it's available when the plant requires it, not when we think. Because we're not very good at guessing what plants need. We typically dump a whole stack of nitrogen in there and a lot of it gases off or washes through if you haven't left the biology in the soil. So things like that. So climate change and agriculture, real, which is we talk a lot about um, energy and uh, driving hybrid cars and all those sort of things. A lot of a lot of our carbon pollution is through agriculture. Hell of a lot of it. Um, health is a pretty basic thing. Systems like this, because you're growing your own food, you've got the intrinsic benefits of. Of, of, of rich diversity of plants available and this is what we're going to talk about today. A lot of these plants, hopefully some people not, haven't seen these things before, but there's enormous diversity of foods available on the planet. Um, Australian native foods for example, there's about approximately 6,000 Australian foods that the Aboriginal used to have. How many do we eat? Probably five, probably five native foods, that's probably about it. And so there's a whole lot of other foods that, and that's just here. That's not all the other foods that we're talking about worldwide. About 30,000 edible plants on the planet. Most of us only come in contact with maybe 200. Most of our main diets, maybe 20 at best. And so there's enormous variety. When I go out into my garden and make a salad, typically my average salad will have 20 to 30 ingredients in it. None of them lettuce. All right? So I'm getting enormous diversity of, of, of well, hopefully, good food because I'm growing it myself and it's fresh. So it's dynamic, it's got everything, all the potential is already there. And that's, and that's just out of the garden. Um, you might want to grow this because you're worried about decreasing diversity of our food. All right? Over the last, um, well, since 1995, we've lost 75% of our of our species that we were relying on have gone. All right. So, for example, in India, when the Green Revolution came, they were growing about 20,000 different forms of rice. Now they're growing whatever. They basically traded off that enormous diversity of foodstuffs that were 
uh, seeds that are handed down from generation to generation to grow in their particular area, they've eaten it and it's gone. And so we've lost an enormous diversity. So part of what we're here at the nursery and one of our main reasons is being is to try and get people to experiment and save your seeds and do all those sort of basic sort of capture some of the diversity. Um, you might want to be, you might want to grow an edible forest garden because it environmentally makes sense. Because they're a nice place to be. They're very tranquil. They are a bit, they're a bit wilder than most people's gardens, but it's, a, it's up to you. Your own design. So you can design it as neatly as you like or as wild as you like. I tend to go a bit more wild because I'm a bit lazy. So I let the plants take control and get my ego out of them as much as possible. And finally, because of the ever-present uh, situations globally, war, yeah. edible forest garden and war, what's the link there? Look at Syria. Syria started because of a famine, because of a water shortage. That's what Syria is all about. All right? it's, it's politics is a complex play. That was ridiculous. But nonetheless, that's, the, that's what started. It started because um, there was a, a um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there was the price of wheat in Russia was the main problem. So Russia withdrew from the world market, there wasn't enough wheat, and so the, the price of, of goods and services, i.e. Um, bread, just went through the roof. And so it made the problem. And we, 15 years later, we had a conflict. So yeah, there's lots of reasons why you want to do this. Any questions? Okay, okay so... So when I talk about, we'll get back to this, but that's very quick. Dave Jackie's one of the founders of Edible Forest Gardens. He's um, an edible forest guru in the States. He's written, the, he's written two big bibles on the subject of edible forest gardens, which I've had the honour of doing a couple of courses with him now. Um, so I'm not making this stuff up. The edible forest gardens started in England for about 30 years ago, um, but it's only really starting here. And there's a couple, couple if anybody's interested in it, this on English is a good book to start with. Uh, Patrick Blockfield. Right? Patrick. By Whitefield. Whitefield, yeah. right. He's now past and pushing, but it's a really good book. Um, he's particularly good. Another guy by the name of Martin Crawford. Right. He's written several <coughs> good books on edible forest gardens. They're really good books to get hold of and just go through the process. This particular one is one of my favourites because, um, as you can see, there's a lot of diversity of food that I talk about, and one of, I'd go to great lengths to hunt these plants down because I'm a bit of a, a collector and I'd get all excited and then I'd talk to my partner and she'd say well that's fantastic what do I do with it and so a book like this is really good because it's okay to have all this stuff but you've got to be able to eat it or else it's a pointless exercise. All right, so. <coughs> what is a forest garden? So I've talked about the layers but effectively it's self-fertilising. What do I mean by that? Um, look at a normal forest. Yeah, normal forest. Does anybody go into a forest and actually fertilise it? Or right. well, how does it happen? On from the plants itself. Right. <laughs> What's the processes? What's the process? And yet they're the most productive structures on the planet and they're looking after themselves. Right. So they're self-maintaining as well. Right. They're self-regulating as well. So moderate, um, a forest system will moderate the temperature. You probably come across that. In a forest, in a, if you're in a forest, they actually recycle a lot of their own nutrients, they recycle their own water, you know, those sorts of functions. You know, they don't have, we don't have, typically have to put too many more inputs into our forest system once it's established. My forest garden at my old house in Woolleydale is now seven, eight years old. Um, 
and we still harvest from it every single day. Now, there's been very little work put into it over the last two or three years, virtually nothing in fact. It's a little bit of pruning and yet it's been productive for all that time. Right? And um, at present I'm up at Monbox, so we're putting in a, a new one, a new larger version of this. But we're very keen for anybody who gets involved in this sort of thing and does an edible forest garden, take photos and let's get some ideas on how these systems work. Because in, in their climate, there's not much information. In England and America, where they've been doing it for 30, 25 years, there's a lot of information. But nothing quite like that. I mean, typically in America, except in Florida, you can't grow avocados. We can't. All right. So we need those information. So everybody, we need more input because it's a movable thing. There's so much to learn out there. Um, and how much time goes into it? I've had this system now. We've put virtually no time into it, and yet we're harvesting from it every day, absolutely every day. Um, and I like because it's uh, but it's not all about. Um, I don't want to go on that. Yes, yeah, self-organising, I think, is probably the key. So it's a, it's a system that is evolving, and you've got to, to a certain extent, allow it to evolve. You can tweak it, but you let the system evolve. Because if you do that and get your ego out of the way, typically it'll be far more productive. Now, what, are the, what, do you, what would you expect to get from a forest garden? It's a 7X from a forest garden. What's one thing you would get from a forest garden starting with F? Food. 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 <laughs> right, what else? Fuel. Fuel, yep. So fuel in the term of in meaning what? Wood and things like that. Yep. Okay. Fodder. Fodder? Yeah, that's a good one. So you can grow a lot of fodder trees for your animals and things like that in a system like this. What else would be one? Fertiliser? Fertiliser, yep. What else? Friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay, we'll go a bit less on a thing, on yeah. And it's fun? Yeah, absolutely. Alright, because they're fun, they're fun places to be. Fibre. What about pharmaceuticals? <laughs> <laughs> For some of us would argue that's where our, that's where our medicine should come from, from the farm. Of course. Right. Maybe that's how we should start uh, spelling it. Actually. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, another one is fibre. Right. I grow some fibre plants. Um, oh, sorry, I have a real problem with spelling it that way. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I don't blame you. Um, and, and the other thing I'd like to put in there is, which is the extra one, which is feelings. That one to me is one of the major things you'll get out of the price out of the system. Because you want the, it's a nice environment to be in. And as a permaculturalist, we typically, we focus a lot on what are we going to get out of the system? What are we going to get out of the system? There's some physical things. You know, how, how are we going to get you know, all this energy we put in, how, what are we going to get out? A lot of us don't. That's a big one. Because if the environment's nice to be in, you'll want to be in it. So I put in things like this one, here, for example. This is a, a, one of the ginger family, I'm sure you probably recognise it. It has a beautiful apricot perfume. Is it useful in any other thing? <laughs> it just looks good, and that's fine. It smells great. That's okay. It fragrance. smells good. It's, it's fragrant. fragrant. Yeah, it's yeah. fragrant. <laughs> yeah, was another one. We put. Yeah, we just changed the one. Yeah. Um, and look, it's going to provide. It's a habitat. It's going to provide a lot of other things because all plants do. But there's no. You, you certainly put something like that in in the system as well because it does smell really, really lovely. And it's a good tap plant, which is another thing. Why not? And bees, yeah. exactly. That's it. Because you're building an ecosystem. Yeah. 
Any questions on that? Except for the spelling. <laughs> well, I'll trade you. I'll take the pharmaceuticals and you can keep the card. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so. Let me go on this one. A big part of any productive system, of course, is typically when I, when I, I go and give this talk a fair bit and I'll go to a library um, and a lot of people will have pieces of paper and I'll get them to write out, draw their favourite tree. And that's one of the things I said, they'll, they'll draw, I said, and they'll go, huh? I said, just your favourite tree. I don't mind what it is, I don't, it's not an art, art class. And they'll draw a tree. And I'll go and ask around, around the room and I'll have a little tally here. Nice. One, 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 one. And everybody will I'll, I'll go and they have no idea what I'm talking about. Because I asked them to draw a tree. They missed the most important thing of the tree, which of course was the root system. Because a lot of us don't think about the whole tree as an organism, as it is. And of course you cannot have the tree without the root system. It's just kidding yourself. But we've been conditioned not to see the actual truth. Because they're like icebergs a lot of the time. Every, most of what everything's happening is actually below ground. And so the soil is an integral part of this. Um, and, and that's when we talk about self-regulating, self-maintaining, self-fertilising systems to do with the soil. Um, and with that in mind, I'll give you an example of how, how this was sort of given to me as an example and made me realise how important this was, is um, in 1964, so it's fairly old knowledge, some scientists walked into an American old growth forest and cut down the tree. And in the tree, well they cut it down, there's a nice looking tree, root system etc. And into the sap stream of the tree, they poured some Radioactive isotopes just get fed into the sap stream. Right. They put in where is it? radioactive calcium and phosphorus. And eight days later, they came. They came back with Geiger counters. So here's a tree being little experiment. And they, with the Geiger counters, they could check where those isotopes, isotopes had actually moved in the forest system. And lo and behold, they'd actually moved 10 metres away. And we were in other trees. But they weren't just in other trees, they were in other, another 20 other species of trees. So they were actually in vines, in other trees, in shrubs, all over the place within a very short period of time. And so they wanted to understand what the mechanism of that was happening. Because, I mean, plants love uh, calcium and phosphorus. They're an essential nutrient for plants. So what, what do you think? How do you reckon that happened? To move from there right through to the other trees in the system. How do you reckon that happened? They're connected to each other. The root system. The root system's actually... Yeah. There's a couple of methods. What they found was the roots actually co-join of different species of trees. They actually join up where they cross each other. And this is, it's old knowledge, but it's becoming more and more common now that people realise this. And so the plants are actually, actually basically sharing nutrients. They don't just share nutrients though, however. They share information as well. Now come the light that you, you can have a tree here, and this can be what they call the mother tree. Have you heard about this? Yeah. Awesome yeah. stuff. Yeah. What's that? Is it called the secret life tree? It's just come out, yeah. It talks about it in a bit more depth, yeah. And so he's able to pass, the mother tree actually is able to pass information and nutrients and all those sorts of things to its offspring, apparently. 
the whole forest acts like a like one single organism effectively. Some plants don't like each other, they'll fight, absolutely. But overall, you'll get this transfer of nutrients between the trees. What's the other mechanism that we use to do that? Fungus? Funguses. Mycorrhizal fungal. Funguses will inhabit right along the root systems, typically. And so you've got um, the amount of diversity in the soil of an old growth forest is quite remarkable. I mean, if you have a look at your own soil at your home, what the ideal thing is what you're actually aiming for is having as much diversity of soil flora as you can. If you're looking at a teaspoon, if you get a teaspoon of your soil, and we can pop it under the microscope, and I can actually teach you how to do that and identify the various structures and things that are living in, in a teaspoon of soil. And you should have, in that teaspoon, you should have at least 20,000 species of bacteria in that, in that you should have approximately 5,000 funguses in that teaspoon. You should have some um, microarthropods, well, the macroarthropods too. You should have some nematodes, hopefully all the beneficial nematodes, not the nasty ones. Why do you want nematodes? because they eat the funguses and the bacteria. And so when they do that, because your fungus comes along, all right, just skip the point, the point, but I'll just go back to it. This tree, why, why do you think it's actually got all this fungus around the root systems <laughs> in an old growth forest? Break down. Yeah, break down, but it's a, it's a different form of fungus. It actually doesn't, it, that, it, that's it's not its purpose. Its purpose is actually to co-join with the actual tree itself. So you have a root tip on a microscope. So there's your, there's your cells of the plants. So what this fungus are actually going to in, inhabit inside the cell. So they actually join, they become one. And so they're able to um, pass um, nutrients between the two way street. So this plant here, yeah. Plants are a remarkable thing. When you think about it logically, plants don't move. They're stuck there. So they've got to have something else. They don't have um, a lot of enzymes. They don't have livers. So they need other things to work with them to break their parent rock material and things like that so they can make it available in plant available form. So they work with funguses. 50% of all the photosynthesis, photosynthesis was produced as sugars. 50%, up to 50% of that all goes straight down to feed the funguses and the bacteria around the root systems. Right. And in exchange for those fungus, for those sugars, the carbohydrates, proteins, etc., the funguses will actually absorb that because they can't photosynthesize. Right. So they're getting all that they need. And they'll go out and actually search out phosphorus, nitrogen, water, whatever its plant needs, right, I'll go and find it and deliver it back to the plant. Really good system. Quite remarkable. And that's why they do it, because it's a mutually beneficial system. I mean, there's been a lot of research now that we're not so different, that we actually need all these funguses and bacteria and things in us. And of course, we're not much different. We all come from the same basic things. But isn't that just remarkable? So it's really important to look after your fungal, uh, after your communities. So where was I? Okay, so you've got all this, all these microbes working for the benefit. What else do those microbes do besides go and find plants? Um, like go and do that. What else do you reckon they do for a plant? They can do that, so they make more soil. What else can they do? Probably some sort of defence. Defence systems. You have the primary defence system for the plant. Um, both on leaf structures, because right, they actually exhibit in, in leaf, and also around the roots. If you've got a root going through the soil and you've got all these funguses growing right around it, along comes a predatory root feeding nematode, 
can't even find the roof. Don't even know it's there. Whereas you go to Mr. Bunnings and buy a chemically induced tomato plant that has no microflora at all because as soon as you put chemicals on a system like this, what do you destroy? All your funguses, all your bacteria, all the things that you need, all your microflora, everything goes. As soon as you put a chemical fertiliser on this stuff, again, it's done. But they will sacrifice themselves in order to do that. And so you go and buy a beautiful tomato plant from Mr. Bunnings, which has been grown by chemical fertilisers, and you put it in your garden. And you buy one from me, because I put compost tea on all mine, so I've got a little bit of um, microbes on mm. And you put the two in. Which do you reckon the root feeding leaf toad is going to go for? Mm. The one that's got all the structure around the roots, mm. or the one that's just done? Or fungus, or predatory fungus, or whatever? Yeah. Then you go back to Bunnings and buy the next bottle. The one. Or you go buy a fungus size <laughs> or insecticide. See, jobs and growth. Yeah. Or that other zero or that um, zero stuff that we don't use at all. Um, so yeah, so look it's really important. Those sorts of things are really, really important when you're looking at establishing a forest garden because it's not it's creating an environment. And once you get your soil right, your soil biology right. Everything will sort of work from that time. Any questions?